It's Friday already, can you believe it? Oh, that week went past quick, didn't it? Well, at least I hope it went past quickly enough for you all to make it nice and fresh to the weekend. <laughs> five stories for you this evening. That's right, five. Count them. One, two, three, four, five. All from Dr. Creepin's vault, which means people have been kind enough to send them to me in the hope that I would read them, and it's my honor and pleasure to do so. So, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear, dear friends. Because now, it's time to listen. I had a bit of a breakdown from stress at work. So, to regain my mental health, I decided that I was going to spend the next weekend off alone in the one-story, one-room cabin my grandfather had owned. We'd been trying to sell it for years since he died, but with no buyers. Probably the cabin's remoteness and lack of electricity or running water scared potential owners off. When I swung open the cabin's squeaky door, I was happy to find that it was in decent shape except for a little dirt and some leaves that I'd no trouble sweeping up with the broom I brought from home. The cabin didn't take long to clean due to its small size and the lack of furniture, besides a table with two chairs and an old metal wood stove. But, but what I had found a little strange, though, while sleeping, was the center of the floor was a little cleaner than the rest of the cabin, and there were little drops of wax everywhere almost like that section had been cleaned more recently than the rest of the floor, and someone has been burning a candle and dripped it all over the wooden boards. I brushed off these subtle oddities, and once the cabin was somewhat clean, I placed my sleeping bag in front of the stove and the electric lantern I'd also brought on top of the table. The cabin had no windows, so it got really dark inside during the day, and especially at night and the lantern would provide me all the light I needed. With the cabin livable again, I put my backpack on and spent the rest of the day hiking in the woods, and just enjoying being away from the pressures of the world outside. I also took a gun with me, but it was only for warding off grizzly bears that populated these parts. I returned to the cabin when it started to get dark outside, and placed my backpack on one of the chairs, and the gun near my sleeping bag for peace of mind, and enjoyed my meal of nuts and energy bars at the table by the bright light of the lantern. Once finished, I carried the lantern to my sleeping bag and read a book I'd brought with me for a little bit, before I drifted off to a restful sleep, which was something that I'd been missing from my life for a while. I was awakened suddenly in the middle of the night by a noise, but I wasn't sure what kind of noise it was until it happened again. There was the rhythmic sound of pounding and the squeaking of boards of something moving across the length of the cabin above my head. It would walk across the entire roof before it would change directions and move back to the beginning and start all over again. I listened some more while I tried to identify it. The footsteps were too loud and heavy to be that of a small animal like a raccoon, and the pattern it followed was that of something that walked on two feet instead of four. It was then that I came to a chilling realization. Someone was pacing back and forth on the cabin's roof. Now, scared out of my mind and still in my sleeping bag, I fumbled for the gun I knew was close by. I found it in the dark and clutched it tightly to my chest, while I continued to listen to the thudding above my head, which was now rivaled by the thudding of my heart. My car was parked just outside, but my car keys were packed somewhere in my backpack, which was still on the chair across the room. I didn't want to go out there unless my keys were securely in my hands and ready to go in the ignition. I would have to find them before I could make a break for my car. 
whoever was crazy enough to come out to this cabin in the middle of the night and walk on my roof wasn't someone I wanted to give enough time to climb down and meet me on the ground, even if I did have my gun. I was convinced that the loud squeak of the wooden door would alert them to my presence, and I would have only minutes to get in my car and drive away. The sounds of walking stopped directly above me, and the thought that it might mean my uninvited guest was getting ready to climb off the roof and attempt to come inside the cabin propelled me into action. I had to get some light in here so I could find my backpack, find my keys, and get out of here. Still, on my back in my sleeping bag, I reached over and turned on the lantern, which barely illuminated the small room enough for me to see the cabin and the pale face looking down at me. Someone hadn't been pacing back and forth on the roof. It had been pacing on the ceiling. I don't remember exactly what happened next. I think I shot at the thing a couple of times before I got up, grabbed my backpack and got the hell out of there. And didn't mention it for years. Until now, when I decided to post this story. You see... I just woke up to sounds of someone walking above my head, but I don't want to shine my phone light up at the ceiling and see its pale face again. My bedroom isn't as dark as the cabin was, and I can clearly see its outline in the dark while it walks across my ceiling. But this time, it isn't pacing the length of the room, it's pacing the width right in front of the door and my only way out. <sighs> no more late nights, I think to myself as I slowly enter my house. I look down at my watch and cringe when I discover it's almost three o'clock. Ugh, I'm too old for this crap. I say out loud, hoping I didn't wake up Dennis. I hate leaving him alone for so long. And although he reassures me he doesn't mind, I know it bothers him. Granted, he's almost sixteen. But he's still a kid who doesn't need the added responsibility of taking care of himself while I kill myself working 12 to 13 hour shifts every night. Since his mother passed away, he hasn't been the same. He's become moody, quiet and downright strange. He went from a self-assured and gregarious young man to a whimpering little coward who seems to be afraid of his own damn shadow. For almost a month now, He's tried to convince me that someone or something sneaks into his room at night, stands at the foot of his bed and just stares at him. I've told him to stop acting like a little bitch who still believes in the boogeyman, but he's insistent and, at times, begs me to let him sleep in my room because he feels safe. Knowing he's been through an emotional tailspin due to his mother's death, I've given in and allowed him to sleep with me occasionally. But that's all about to end soon. I, I'm losing my patience with this things that go bump in the night shit. Completely exhausted, I clumsily stumble up the stairs and quietly open his bedroom door and peer in. <sighs> Thank God he's fast asleep. The soft hum of his breathing puts me at ease. <laughs> Maybe all this scaredy cat nonsense is over. I don't even bother to take off my clothes and just topple onto my bed. As my body sinks into the mattress, I let out a long sigh. Unconsciousness soon follows. I don't know what time it is when I'm awakened by the sound of footsteps. Oh, through blurry eyes, I see the silhouette of my son standing in the doorway with his arms crossed. <sighs> God damn it, Dennis, I snarl. I'm getting tired of this. 
Come on, but this is the last time. He begins walking towards the bed. Dad, it's not me. A terrified voice whispers in my ear. My eyes widen as I realize Dennis is actually lying beside me. The sea called to her, its wails so powerful it rolled the waves, crashing loudly within itself, further spreading the remnants of wood and cloth. So desperate were its pleas, she almost missed just what it was that broke it so. Its hands so strongly gripped the splintered wood, though he was bathed in crimson. His grip held strong. Though his hair fell against his eyes, the ebony did little to shield the emerald shine, as if there were sunlight in his soul. He was fading, though he would not accept his fate. She cradled him, the fear within him brightening that wide, bright stare. Though she knew it forbidden, she whispered. Though she knew it forsaken, she lowered her hood. His grip loosened then as she slowly sank beneath the chaos with him. She was not what was foretold to him. She was not skeletal. Her eyes were not dark. Her grip was not ice. She was warm. Her voice a soft, unhindered melody against the deep, black silence of the sea. Obsidian embraced him as she drew his essence from his lips. Her kiss was gentle, her eyes the sapphire of the sky. He surrendered then as her voice enveloped him. As his light faded, his words echoed within her as he sighed against her. She would forever remember his words. Death is beautiful. Why did you do it? The question was so dryly put and unemotional. It was a simple string of words, but I didn't think there was any simple answer. I shrugged. I don't like myself. The tall man flipped through some papers on a clipboard and asked, Did that start before or after the accident? I suppressed an eye roll. <laughs> well, Doc, the easiest response would be the accident although I can't say I was a great human being before that. But really, it started when I realized I could see how people die. The accident, I answered, knowing that if I told him the truth, I'd end up locked away for a very long time. He continued reviewing the paperwork that detailed what the accident had medically caused and how I had been treated. I tried my best not to look at him, I didn't want to look at anyone anymore. I knew he was dressed in a crisp white coat, with a blue button-up and black slacks. I knew he had short, sandy blonde hair and dark eyes. I knew what he was supposed to look like, but that's not what I saw. What I saw was a gaping knife wound in the side of his neck, blood-soaked clothes, a torn shirt from another stab wound in his abdomen. I saw dirt and tiny pebbles stuck to the side of his face from falling onto the ground. I saw pale, dead skin and smelled steak and bourbon. The smells were usually worse, but this time it was at least bearable enough that I didn't gag. 
Okay, well, Clarissa, I'm going to send you for a psych evaluation and some blood work to start in the morning. I'd expect you to be here at least the mandatory 72 hours, just like any other person who would attempt suicide. Hopefully we can figure out why you feel this way, if the accident somehow caused it, and get you all fixed up and on your way soon. For now, just try to rest. I nodded and laid back against the pillow. The doctor put the chart back in its place and walked out of the door. I glanced at the girl in the bed next to mine. She seemed engrossed in some TV show about a detective or something. I rolled over to my side, facing away from her. Closed my eyes and let myself drift off to sleep, aided by the painkillers in my system. When I awoke, it was completely dark in the room and my bed felt alien to me. I looked around at the bland surroundings and remembered that I was in the hospital. Something seemed off, though. There was a smell. I sprung into a sitting position quickly when I realized I was smelling smoke. I couldn't hear any alarms going off or any chaos in the hall, so I was left confused and a little terrified. I pushed myself out of the bed and walked to the closed door, peeking through the window and seeing nothing amiss. But it smells like there's a fire. How can no one else notice that? I thought, a sense of panic gripping my chest. I took a few deep breaths and moved into the bathroom, shutting the door behind me. When the small room became bathed in fluorescent light, I saw my reflection. A pale, thin girl that desperately needed to eat and sleep, and stop seeing dead things. It clicked then, that I was probably smelling the fire from someone's death. Maybe someone had been admitted in the next room, or there was a nurse that was destined to die in some sort of place. This thought helped to calm me a bit. I used the toilet, washed my hands and splashed water on my face, before exiting the bathroom and climbing back into my small, white, impersonal hospital bed. I didn't hate hospitals, really, but I hated how vanilla they were. There's almost never any colour or character. I sat in the bed, absent-mindedly staring towards the window, which was on the wall closest to the other patient, when I realised she was sound asleep, half curled up on her side, facing me. She looked normal. From the little light shining in from the window of the door on my side of the room, and the lights from the parking lot shining through the window on her side of the room, I could see that, other than some bruises and scratches on her arms and cheek, she didn't look dead. She looked alive. She looked like she was supposed to. But why? There was movement in my peripheral, and I felt my breath involuntarily catch in my lungs. I followed the movement to look under her bed. On her back lay a girl, almost identical to the one in the bed. She was reaching up and running fingers over the bottom of the bed. Her arms were darkened and dirty. Her hair was splayed around her head and looked singed. Suddenly, she slammed her hands, palms down, to the floor on each side of her, and snapped her head to look at me. I realized where the smoke smell had come from now. Half of her face was covered in blackened, crispy skin that looked like it was falling or peeling away from the bone. I saw that she had the pale skin of a corpse where it wasn't covered in dirt or charred beyond recognition. I choked and gagged on the sudden wave of burnt flesh and hair that assaulted my nose and throat. She stared at me, both of us frozen for at least a minute. Then she slowly raised a finger to her lips and whispered, Shh. I felt myself barely nod. The burned girl pulled herself slowly from under the bed, on the opposite side from me. I watched as her dead legs bent and shuttered, while she positioned herself to stand. Once she was standing, still doubled over at the waist, 
I moved my gaze from below the bed to above it, where she was standing next to her living twin. There were barely any audible pops and a slight wheezing as she fully righted herself. She gently placed a hand, burned with sections of white bone showing, on the shoulder of the sleeping girl. She looked at the girl with what I can only describe as love and compassion, as if she deeply cared for her. I saw her grip tighten around the girl's shoulder, and her black nails dig into the fabric of her hospital gown. Those dead eyes flashed up at me once again, and a wide, malicious smile spread across her twisted face. The half that was destroyed gave a slight ripping noise as the corner of her mouth tore open to make her smile even wider. In one quick motion, she reached over, yanked the girl's jaw open and crawled on top of her. The broken, blistered and scorched body contorted with awful tears, pops and cracks as it forced itself into the girl's mouth and down her throat. I watched in horror, unable to move, to scream, to breathe. Right before the sleeping girl's mouth closed, I saw something bright in her throat. The dead girl's eye, looking out at me. Once again I heard, shh. Tabitha woke with a start. Turning her head quickly from left to right, she scanned her dark bedroom. The little girl had never been afraid of the dark. In fact, Tabitha rather preferred this time of day. However, tonight felt different. Maybe the unsettling feeling she had was from the disorientation that comes from awaking so suddenly. Perhaps she was not actually awake, but still asleep and dreaming right this moment. She smiled, and quickly dismissed this theory as the lingering remnants of sleep lifted from her mind. In its place, confusion emerged, for the parts of her brain that were alert and active while she slumbered had heard something. It was fuzzy and already fading from her memory but she thought she could recall something out of place. Something strange. Had she heard someone giggling in the darkness? Slowly sitting up in bed, she intently listened to the night. The ever-curious eight-year-old was in wonderment upon the realization of how loud the silence could be. She heard the long groan of the foundation travel through the walls of the old house. The light tapping of a tree branch in the breeze caught her attention. She could even make out the monotonous tick-tock, tick-tock from an ancient grandfather clock that sat proudly downstairs. More and more sounds soon revealed themselves to Tabitha. But none were out of the ordinary, nor did any cause her fear or alarm. Satisfied that all was calm, Tabitha lowered her head to her pillow. She froze in place when creaking floorboards from steps on the other side of her closed bedroom door cut through the silence. The steps were slow and profound as they grew closer and closer. Upon reaching her bedroom door, it paused. Tabitha could hear the slight scraping of fingertips rubbing against the door. True silence fell over the room and remained unbroken until a soft, high-pitched giggle emerged, sending shivers down the girl's spine. She could not tell if it came from a boy or girl, but it sounded muffled as if the giggler was trying their hardest to hold in a flood of sniggers and laughter. There was also 
a sadness to the chuckles, and for a moment Tabitha thought she might have mistaken it for sobs, or maybe weeping. Cautiously, Tabitha climbed out of bed and placed her small feet on the cold floor. She made her way silently to her bedroom door and slowly turned the old brass knob. She was a brave little girl and prepared herself to face whatever monster stood on the other side with a loud squeal from hinges neglected over the ears. Tabitha slowly opened the door and was greeted to a crimson balloon bobbling in the air at eye level. She cocked her head curiously and thought, what an odd thing to find. The balloon was large and shiny. Its red color was vibrant, and its silver ribbon sparkled brilliantly. There was nothing out of the ordinary or cause for alarm except for the clump of grey mud that plastered the end of the ribbon to the ground and held it in place. <laughs> Tabitha turned towards the giggling, now coming from downstairs. She slowly walked to the edge of the stairs and once again saw a balloon, this time blue of colour, tied with a silver ribbon and floating at the bottom of the steps. Fascinated by the object, she neglected to see the foot and handprints along the walls and ceilings as she descended the stairs. The prints were from the same mud that used to hold the balloons in place, and spiraled the side of the walls to the ceiling as if up or down had no meaning for the owner of those clawed hands and feet. She plugged the ribbon's end from the clump of mud that anchored the pleasant thing in place, and proudly looked upon her two fantastic prizes she had gained tonight. <laughs> from behind the girl, the snickering giggles ran out with even more failing restraint. It was as if any moment... A frenzy of uncontrollable laughter would erupt from its owner. At the end of the hall, she stood in front of the open door that led to the backyard. Obscured in shadows, handprints at the top of the doorframe peppered the wall where it entered. She approached the opening, and in the night, a shining light revealed the most amazing balloon of them all. It was in the shape of the letter T, for Tabitha, she surmised. Like its ribbon, it too was silver, but it sparkled so brilliantly in the darkness. The twinkling light reminded the girl of pixie dust from the many fairy tales told to her at bedtime. As she approached the balloon, the giggles became more persistent. Its intensity rose as the ability to restrain the laughs grew ever more challenging. Closer and closer, Tabitha approached her final prize. Without realizing it, she had stepped over and passed the boundaries of the doorframe and was now outside the protective walls of her homestead. Tabitha lifted her small hand to take hold of the fantastic balloon, but froze when she saw that its ribbon was not held in place by the slimy mud this time. It was a dirty hand that held the balloon's ribbon. The hand slowly rose and offered its gift to her. Tabitha took a step back and gasped. The thin hand once again gestured for the girl to take the thin ribbon from its grasp. The hand was attached to a gnarly arm that disappeared into the shadows. Both the little girl and the hand remained frozen, neither making the first offerings of greetings towards one another. Giggling Man's broad grin slowly emerged from the shadows. Deep and sad eyes appeared next. 
past. The creature was horrifying, but its wide eyes and a broad smile from red lips were disarming. Hunched on all fours, the beast contorted its limbs in ways not intended by nature. The thin and naked body, completely covered in the mud, gave off a stench of sulfur that made Tabitha think of rotten eggs. Immediately, Tabitha felt pity for the poor creature entangled before her. The painful grin tore and stretched into its face, and its mournful eyes touched her heart. The giggling man turned and effortlessly bent over backward and upside down with a hand still outstretched, offering its gift. Tabitha could not help herself and let out a tiny giggle of her own. The giggling man continued to let out hysterical and nervous giggles as he stood in his backward arch and waving his free hand in the air to an unheard melody. The desperation in his eye intensified as it continued to snicker and offer its balloon from its hand. Tabitha looked deeply into those sad eyes and finally convinced herself that no ill intent existed there. She smiled. Taking a step forward, the girl reached for the bloom. Tabitha, no! Having awoken from a strange and sudden sleep, Tabitha's mother knew something was amiss. Fear gripped her heart upon seeing the girl's empty bedroom and muddy prints along the walls. Racing downstairs, she arrived at the open door just in time to see the girl take the object from the Yogitcha demon that stood before her. The moment the girl took hold of the ribbon, the sound of shattering glass rang loud from the collapse of every protection spell cast upon the house. The powerful spells meant to hide, shield, and protect against all manner of beast and demon was broken and no more. Now, nothing stood between them and the darkness that approached. The giggling man quickly turned upright and faced the little girl. He towered over her at his full height. The sad eyes were gone and replaced with milky red orbs that showed absolute delight upon seeing the defenseless little girl. The grin etched on his face widened and stretched its white flesh. Blood flowed from the corners of his mouth and teeth, thin as needles, tore through the skin. As if all was calm, Tabitha turned her back to the creature and looked toward her mother. She raised her small hand to show off her new balloons and waved with the other. She smiled a radiant smile only a daughter could produce for her mother. It was a smile of love. A smile unaware of the danger and malicious intent looming behind her. The creature lowered itself and prepare to lunge at the little girl. It trembled with lust from the anticipation of tearing into the young flesh and gorging on the little girl's blood. It let out a loud squeal of giggles at the thought of smearing that hot liquid over its dried and desiccated body. With the girl facing away, it failed to notice the change occurring in Tabitha's eyes. Gone were the hazel green and the white corners. In their place, orbs of the blackest night stared out into the evening sky. Orbs of sight that saw everything. The giggling man pounced, fully prepared to devour the child that dared show her back to it. To its surprise, the demon found itself suspended and frozen in place. In mid-air, Tabitha took hold of the creature's essence in an unbreakable grip. 
With invisible hands, she explored the creature's body in both the physical and spiritual planes. Once curiosity no longer held the child's attention, she began to play. Unseen fingers took hold of the demon and twisted and tore at the creature's flesh. The skin from the creature's back was peeled from the muscle. Bone was bent until they split and shattered. Every organ within its torso was squeezed and eviscerated until yellow juices soaked the ground below its suspended body. Never once did the tormented beast cease its high-pitched and insane giggling through gurgling blood and vomit pouring from its contorted mouth. And all the while, Tabitha laughed and giggled at the sight, still restraining the beast in her mind's eye. The powerful little witch smiled at her newfound toy, but like so many others before it, she grew bored. Although it was fun to play with those who dared to deceive her, it quickly lost its element of pleasure. She released it, and the unrecognizable clump of flesh hit the ground with a sickening squish. A small and almost inaudible giggle was still coming from the entanglement of bones, innards, limbs, and intestines. Tabitha's mother ran to the girl and scooped her up in her arms. While embracing the child, she looked nervously around. With the protection spells having been broken, they were defenseless and no longer hidden to the world. It was widely known that Yogitsha demons are summoned in threes. It was wise to assume the other two would not be far behind their fallen brother. It was also common knowledge to summon Yogitsha demons required immense power, rooted in ancient and forbidden witchcraft, or allegiance to a demon of the highest order to bind these dark creatures to their will. Tabitha's mother brought up her foot and stomped her heel into the demon's skull until no more laughter could be heard, and only silence remained. Backing out of the night air and into the house, she scanned the darkness for any sound or movement. They would need to leave this place immediately. Ever since Tabitha's birth, they had been on the run. Ever since her existence was made known, Tabitha's mother had done everything possible to keep her safe. She knew the child was extremely powerful possibly more powerful than any witch to have ever walked the earth. It was her mandate to keep the child safe until she came of age. As she quickly gathered any belongings of importance, Tabitha's mother thought of the prophecy recited to her before the great covenant dissolved. The words rang loud in her mind, and she took the little girl's hand and exited the house in the warm spring night. They would run and hide once again, but those words would give her strength and comfort. Words from an ancient prophecy that gave her a promise of hope of a new day when they would no longer need to run. Listen, my daughters, and listen well. When the shadow of Bishagor falls upon the sons of Adam and the morning star makes war with the sun of sun, the mother of Endor will tear down the four towers of the world's corners. Before the waters from the gates of the ancient well crack and drown the land, and fires from the first mountains fall and scorch the sky, a child will be born. This child will know power like no other, and return the stolen magic robbed from the daughters of Eve by the god of lies.
Hope you enjoyed listening to those as much as I did reading them. Well, it's the weekend. I hope you're not working. You all deserve a little bit of time to relax to yourself. Have a bit of fun. And thanks to everyone who donated to the uh, fun for Tammy Fav. I'm sure she appreciates it greatly. Well, I've got a busy week next week, but I have still made time to read some stories for you. So, see you all again on Monday. But for now, bye-bye and sweet dreams.